Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing slow channel myasthenic syndrome. Okay, so I've reminded you now of the structure of the neuromuscular junction where we have alpha motor neurons synapsing onto skeletal muscle fibers. Right, we're now looking at the structure of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor so that we can look specifically at the structure of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor within uh, skeletal muscle fibers, okay? And then try and understand what happens in slow channel myasthenic syndrome. Right, so uh, we've discussed the structure of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, how it's made up of these five separate proteins which come together to make this pentamer here. Okay, we've then taken one of these protein subunits out of that pentamer and looked at its membrane spanning topology and we've seen that we have this extracellular domain here. So I should just label that. I'll label it as the EC domain. EC standing for extracellular and um, this is on the outer face of the receptor. You then have these four membrane spanning alpha helices labelled M1 through M4, okay? So M1 is this first one, M2 the second one, M3, and then M4, uh, which form the transmembrane region of the uh, ligand-gated iron channel. And then finally, you have this large intracellular loop between M3 and M4, and that makes up the intracellular domain of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Right, okay, so what we now want to discuss is how you actually assemble a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So what would be really nice, what would have been really simple, is if there was just one type of this protein. So if there was just one gene which coded for the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit, and then you just use that gene five times, put it together, and that was the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. It's not like that, I'm afraid. Instead, we have 17 genes which code for subunits of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And all of these 17 genes will have a slightly different sequence of organic bases um, within them, and therefore will code for a protein which has a slightly different sequence of amino acids. So all of the proteins here will be slightly different. However, they will all still form this same membrane-spanning topology here, okay? And they can all form a fifth of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So, to help us gain some sort of understanding of this, they have grouped these 17 genes into different families. So firstly, let's have the first family, it's known as the alpha family, and this contains 10 of the 17 genes. So the alpha family contains a whole bunch of these genes which code for uh, subunits of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So it has the alpha 1 gene in it, the alpha 2 gene, the alpha 3 gene, and then it goes on all the way up to the alpha 10 genes. So you have 10 genes within this family, alpha 1 to alpha 10. Okay, and they are all separate genes which code for proteins which all have this same structure but will all differ slightly. So they will have slightly different sequences of amino acids. Okay, so you can therefore build an alpha-1 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit. You can build an alpha-2 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit. And all the way up to you can build an alpha-10 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit. Okay, but that's only 10 of the genes. I said we had 17. So we have another family known as the beta family, which has four genes in. Cunningly labeled beta-1, beta-2, beta-3, and beta-4. Okay, so these again are four genes which code for nicotinic acetylcholine receptor protein subunits, which are similar enough that they can all perform the same function, but they do have slightly different sequences of amino acids. Finally, there are, we need three more genes. Now, these aren't put into families. Instead, they are just called the gamma, the delta, and the epsilon gene. So, basically, we have 17 different genes which code for 17 different uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunits. So this suddenly becomes a lot more complicated. So 
these, all of these genes, all of these proteins that are coded by these genes, uh, they all are only a fifth of a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So they have to be pentamerized like this. The question then arises, how do you pentamerize them? Can, is it the case that the only way you can pentamerize them is to make five identical copies of each gene and then put them together so that you have five identical copies in each one? So, for instance, if we took alpha-1, can you only make alpha-1, 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 alpha-1? That concept is known as a homopentamer. Okay, so if you use the same subunit, the same type subunit, in all five slots of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, then that's called a homopentameric uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, for alpha-1, that alpha-1 homopentamer is not actually seen that much in the body. Instead, um, an example of a homopentamer that's seen a lot is alpha-7. So we see hugely, not at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the neuromuscular junction, but in the brain you have a huge number of these alpha-7, and then we put brackets around that 5 to denote that you'll have 5 of the um, so alpha-7 subunits all put together uh, to make the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor homopentamer. So you see a lot of these alpha-7,5 homopentameric nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the brain, and they're very important uh, for nicotine addiction. However, they're not important at the neuromuscular junction. So, um, basically, it's not that simple. You don't just make homopentamers. If you just made homopentamers, you'd just have 17 different nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and things would be nice and simple, but you don't. Unfortunately, uh, you make heteropentamers as well, where you have different subunits in each of the five slots. So let me now tell you about the subunit composition of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, but we'll do that in the next video.